Thank you, Alvaro. I'd like to begin by thanking the Independent Institute, the Atlas Foundation, and the John Templeton Fund for hosting this gathering, which is probably the only meeting in Washington, D.C. this week where no one is looking for a job in the Obama administration, <laughs> or no one is leaving the government and looking for a job outside the government, or maybe the only meeting where nobody's looking for a bailout, although we'll have to ask around later. Uh, I met Alvaro a long time ago in Davos, in the, the, one of those forums. He was uh, traveling from Peru. I was traveling from Bolivia. I was uh, vice president then. And in that gathering, you talk about economic, political developments, and you have a night called Latin American Night. His father, the incomparable Mario Vargas Llosa, gave the speech that night. And I still remember the, the wonderful story he told. He said, the problem many times with Latin America and our lack of development our disrespect for entrepreneurship and growth and possibilities of living under rule of law comes because we do not leave magic realism in the books that he writes so well. We put it into politics. And we create this grander than life figures, Menem, Fujimori, Chavez, Montesinos, that Mario Vargas Llosa in his best day could not make all that up. And those are the ones that are attracting notoriety and, and get all the news. And we were in Switzerland, which is many times held up as the paradigm of prosperity and development. And Mario Vargas Llosa asked that night, name one Swiss politician that you know. As a matter of fact, I think they had seven and they rotate and they have this system where you go and then whoever was ruling then the next year is on the side. And, uh, the excitement is on the cheese, you know, varieties of cheese and different types of cheeses that you have, but it's not in the political direction. And I think that has to do with what is in the book for this uh, forum, Lessons from the Poor. We have this grander than life figures, and I wish we had more uh, Añanos, Flores, Kenyan, Nigerian retailers, entrepreneurs that are more no, 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 uh, noteworthy than the ones that we have many times in politics. I also know that you have another book coming that shows countries that do this. And I think when countries figure out a way where they have differences in politics, as we should always have them, but you know, this could be the right, and this, this could be the right, and this could be the left, like Spain, but they travel down that path, and you can change governments, but you still always move forward. In Latin America, many times we have huge discrepancies, and we go from the right to the left to the right, and we nationalize, we privatize, we nationalize, and we keep moving around in circles, so we don't find that path uh, to prosperity. And it is not because our people are less talented, their brains are smaller, or don't have the drive. I think th these examples prove and show that. Talents, brains, drive, entrepreneurship are evenly distributed. What is not evenly distributed or randomly distributed in the world is rule of law, sensible, rational governments, and institutions that work for the people. And I think that's what a forum like this is, is all about. And let me make uh, remarks along the following lines. First, understanding that what I'm going to say relates more to Latin America than other areas, the context and the evolution in the last decades of democracy and economic reform. What, second, what lessons we, we can derive from that in the domestic front and the inter uh, regional integration front. And then the tail uh, at the end of the Pirate of the Caribbean. You may have seen some of those movies. My daughters watch them. Uh, we live with a real one, the Pirate of the Caribbean, uh, and I'll tell you uh, the effect that it has on freedom, rule of law, and governable democracies in our part of the world. First, the context of time and how things have evolved. I think in Latin America, we, we have gone from what was called the end of history, the 80s and the 90s, where it was thought that democracy and markets have prevailed, and we left behind three decades where we had the almighty authoritarian state from the 50s to the 80s, with exceptions, we basically had the single party or military rulers all across Latin America, just about, that would run the economy, would make all the goods and services, or if they didn't make them, they would tell you how much they would cost, or they set the rates for uh, interest in the banking system, or for currency, and tariffs, and taxes, and we know how that story wound up, from the 50s to the 80s, to hyperinflation and the big crash. And that brought about what I was describing at the beginning, the supposed end of history with democracies uh, and markets. I think that led to a triumphalist wave that was very misguided. 
We did attain stabilization. We did lower tariffs. We did bring in some private investment. But many times, that was done at the expense of competitive markets and disregarding completely the buildup of institutions and independent judiciaries. It thought that it was enough to stabilize, lower inflation, and privatize, and the rest would somehow take care of it. And many times in our part of the world, we would have nice, beautiful legislation and rules to attract foreign investment, but we never had that legislation or regulation to foster, develop, or unleash the private entrepreneurs inside our own uh, countries. And I think we lived through that. From this end of history period, I think the worst thing that came out was the following. Everybody started using the Washington Consensus as something that was developed in this city, which is not very popular in Latin America, and it was given as a recipe to be applied across the board in Latin America. I was a young minister of finance once. I had good friends, Ernesto Cedillo from Mexico, Hernán Vigi from Chile, and at a forum a long time ago, we started hearing about the Washington Consensus, and we started talking. I said, have you read that? I said, no. Have you? No. Stabilization, lower inflation, changing the macroeconomic situation was not something that you needed to read somewhere else to be able to do. And it was being done in Latin America well before somebody wrote it here. But when somebody wrote it here, it became a nice packaging uh, on, on this Washington Consensus that could be easily attacked and as a matter of fact, the worst thing about it was that Argentina was held up as a shining example of the Washington Consensus. And Argentina's exchange rate had nothing to do with what we did in Bolivia, or what they did in Chile, or what they did in other countries. And that brought about political consequences later. I mean, Argentina's convertibility rate, uh, exchange rate, was basically you know, the way that you would lose weight if you don't want to be disciplined. How do you lose weight? How do you lower inflation? Exercise and eat less. I guess you could lose weight by stapling your lips shut with convertible dollar bills. But a couple months later, where are you going to wind up? I mean, it was not done because of exchange rate. It was done to lower inflation. It became a religious experience. You could not question it. It was just something that was there. Uh, and it brought about the demise of that system. And I think probably the worst and most misguided invitation ever was when the IMF in 99 held up Argentina as the shining example of those types of policies. And we were all trying to hide under the table because we knew that it was not sustainable. But a few years later, or a couple years later, that came about and it imploded. So from that end of history type, where we did not have institutions being built up or sensible rule of law, we have gone from that to this very peculiar last decade in Latin America, the, the largest seesaw that I've ever seen. From 98 till 2008, we have gone from the last half decade, 98, 2003, CEPAL, the, the economic think tank for the UN for Latin America, calls it that, the last half decade, to 2003, 2008, the uh, bonanza of those five years. And through that time, in the last half decade, it was easy to blame stigmas or stereotypes like the Washington Consensus or neoliberal doctrines or what have you. And then we got rulers like Chavez, uh, Brazil devalued, Argentina imploded, and we know what happened all through that. It was a very difficult five years. And the, the amazing thing is that that was followed by the best economic external conditions that Latin America, although I should perhaps restrict it to South America, has ever had because of this magic combination of China manufacturing everything, selling it to the US, parking the surplus liquidity in treasury bonds or financial instruments, keeping interest rates low. And if you're in Latin America, it was the best of all worlds. Low interest rates meant foreign direct investment flows. Construction boom in the US and Spain meant our workers coming here, sending remittances back and the Chinese with Hu Jintao buying everything we could, we could make in commodities, copper, tin, zinc, soybean, lead, sugar. It, it's impossible to find a confluence of events where you get high investment rates, higher than the structural situation warrants, high remittances, and very high levels of uh, exports because of the prices. I'll give you an example of how this has changed with just one country, mine. 
Had you told me five years ago that my country today would be exporting five times more, I would have laughed you out of the room. But we do that, not because we produce more, because all is prices, gas, soybeans, oil. Peru can tell you some of that. Chile can tell you some of that. And that's what changed dramatically in those economic times. The hard thing about that is that it makes you lazy. Except for Chile, which saves for a rainy day, the rest of us, we just drink it as fast as we can get it and celebrate and have a good time. The only ones that say, have saved for a rainy day, and here comes the rain, have been the Chileans. The rest is just enjoy it as, as it comes. Now we're living through times that I don't know where this is going. The subprime crash uh, and the effects that that is bringing about. But I think we should learn from this that we cannot adjust or do our policies based on the booms and busts of cycles and the Chinese buying commodities or interest rates that are fixed somewhere else, but rather look to see how we create conditions where the people in this book are not the exception, but rather the rule. And let me move to that in terms of what challenges we face domestically and regionally. First, domestically. For way too long, for my taste, we have argued about the oil in the car, uh, the battery, the, the unleaded gasoline or leaded gasoline, and not enough about the engine, which is the institutions that make the economies function. We many times talk about corruption, but we talk about it in a frivolous way. Corruption is a child getting the fever. How do I fix the child? I give him aspirin. Okay, the, the, the fever goes down. A week later, here comes the fever again, another aspirin. In essence, that's how you do corruption. Somebody does something wrong, comes out on the paper, you resign, fire, say you're gonna investigate, nothing happens, then another one and another one, and you keep at it, and you do not address the infection that allows that to fester, which is the institutional weakness in the country. The institutional weakness of having judges that need to be nationalized because they're privatized. They work for whoever pays most as opposed for upholding the rule of law of having not put in, uh, in place systems where everything is subject to the petty bribe, getting an ID, getting a birth certificate, getting a graduation title, getting a driver's license, anything. You, you use the old come back tomorrow, mañana, mañana, come back tomorrow, which means come back with more money. And we never worked on fixing those types of systems. And if you talk about doing business, like the World Bank reports uh, show, then that becomes also another source uh, for corruption. Uh, and we, we have the institutions that should be working for the people on a permanent basis work for the politicians on the short term. Highway department, tax collection agency, customs agency, full of corruption and problems. Those are the institutions that you need to be functioning and working so they can help and aid and work for the flores, the añanos, and the entrepreneurs that just want to do business and don't want to be subject to all the blockades and impediments that the government always puts on the side uh, or against the people uh, as a barrier. We tried some of that in Bolivia. I, I hate to tell you that we did a good, good work and it's been dismantled. Uh, institutional uh, buildup, I would recommend always use the deep, the deep throat uh, uh, motto, follow the money. Where is the money? Highway agency, customs, taxes. Put in good civil servants long term and make sure their job tenure for qualified people is longer than the ministers. Our pyramids in Latin America are inverted. The higher the job, the less time you should have on that job. Ours are the reverse. Every minister can get three undersecretaries. Every one of those undersecretaries can have three or four directors. And on down, the pyramid is totally inverted. And then if you have a short term in public service, you maximize your own personal profit as opposed to working uh, for the people. And you don't worry about putting in place systems where you're working for the citizens as opposed to whoever is temporarily holding power. I think all through the economic discussions, the things that entrepreneurs need are clear rules and institutions that will make sure that they get the conditions they need to prosper and, and come out ahead as opposed to short-term profit because politics is the best business in town uh, when the institutions are run that way. That is a domestic challenge, certainly the, the one on the registrations, the administrative systems, and I'm not going to dwell on that for a long time, but I would like a general rule in Latin America. Tramites, you know, when you have to get a license or a permit of any kind, should have a rule that at 10 days, positive silence. 
If a government authority has not said anything in 10 working days, you get it, whether it's a driver's license, a birth certificate, a business permit, or what have you. As opposed to, you got to keep coming back, and that, that's where you get the, so many days to form a business, so many days to get a permit, and, and what have you. And we always, in campaigns in Latin America, talk about jobs. And when you can't deliver jobs because you choke the entrepreneurial drive by lack of institutions, rule law, or administrative systems, guess what citizens have? Three ways out. Informality, criminality, movability. You go to the informal sector underground, you get into a, a gang or become a mara, or you come to Washington, D.C. or Spain looking for the jobs that you never found because of the way that this, the economic system was choked to death. Anyway, those are some of the domestic challenges that we have, and the problem is that there's two ways of doing it. One is to keep finding the champions and the heroes that can overcome all the difficulties, or to change the system so they do not necessarily have to be heroes to prevail and prosper uh, in a system that is, that is thwarting their ability to, to make progress and, and move ahead. In this, I know Bill Easterly will talk at the, at the end about aid, and I've been in a couple panels with him about aid and how ineffective or, or badly it was handled. Despite popular perceptions, I would tell you that the organizations in this city are laggers, not leaders. They do not, contrary to reputation, have lead or instill policies in Latin America. I've never seen that. From the 50s to the 80s, when state capitalism was its heyday, the IDBs and the World Bank would lend so the state could build refineries, hydroelectric plants, and everybody was happy. Four or five missions a year, everything controlled from Washington or Brussels. When that was dismantled, same system, structural adjustment credits, and then uh, conditions on, on trying to change some of those things. And now, those same organizations are relending back to the governments that nationalized and privatized and nationalized again, and they're relending so they can build refineries uh, and, uh, and the other things again. So to expect that things will be done the right way because of enlightened organizations here, I think, is to not know the, the reality of how it works. If it was to my liking, and I, my country needed cooperation, and it was very important, and we managed it, and let me tell you, we had to have an office full of people just to tend to the missions that would come because it's cooperation tourism. They would just come over and over and over again. The best way to get cooperation is to get it through programs, not individual projects with flags per country, that are country-owned and that are decentralized in its execution. Uh, the last comment I'll make about the, about the U.S. and the regional policies. If it was up to me, three, I mean, you could have an agenda of 1,500 points. Three things that I would concentrate on in terms of hemispheric integration for private entrepreneurship and the development. One, energy, sensible policies on energy. It is outrageous that Brazilian ethanol is subject to a tariff of 54 cents when it comes from Brazilian sugar, and the corn ethanol has a subsidy of $1.90 here, and you're trying to fight the um, global warming and climate change uh, and what have you. I mean, there, there is enough sugar, enough wind, enough solar, enough oil, enough gas in the hemisphere to have hemispheric self-reliance. I do not think we'll see United States self-reliance in my lifetime, but I think you can drive towards hemispheric self-reliance by mobilizing all the resources that we have in the hemisphere with electric grids that are built uh, it, here. Number two is I would take a page from the Europeans, and instead of having all this Millennium Challenge accounts, USAID programs out the galore, I would take what the Europeans do. Here, compensation, regional funds. The US puts its part, Canada puts its part, Brazil puts its part, we all put our part. And develop the infrastructure that allows for good integration to happen. Up until a few years ago, Germany was giving Spain oodles of money through EU compensation funds, but we have never found a system here where Brazil can help Nicaragua or the US can help Guatemala on a more permanent basis. And finally, on migration, I think it's a huge opportunity for development with the marriage of debit, micro-lending, and cellular penetration, it should be a lot easier to make sure that remittances, which are charity that trickles down to people, can be used as capital for housing, for development, for capital formation when it goes uh, to Latin America. And I think you know any change of government brings about a good opportunity. And I think the new president of the US certainly will have a great opportunity. The US is always Goliath, and in the Bible and in politics, Goliath never fares too well, 
but new President Obama is David disguised as Goliath, or maybe the other way around, and I think that would be somewhat uh, helpful. Uh, I do hope, just for the sake, I, I have to make one, uh, one commercial, is I hope Colombia gets its free trade agreement. If, if Colombia doesn't get the free trade agreement, we will not have any anymore. Nobody will seriously bargain with the U.S. And you have to understand that the Colombian state is under siege from the FARC inside and from Chavez outside. And they both have a great product, cocaine and oil, that has duty-free access entry into the United States. And here's Colombia trying to sell textiles, and the enemies, inside and outside, have their own free trade agreement with the U.S. That makes it uh, doubly tough. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up with, um, in terms of, it will be remiss if I mention all this and would pretend that if you install proper administrative systems, change the judiciary reform, uh, the social systems inside the country, that would be enough. We have currently underway, for the last few years, the largest single threat to democracy and freedom in Latin America that we've ever faced. The Pirate of the Caribbean, what Mr. Chavez goes around and does. This is the most dangerous, best finance, best structure, best working with the best campaign team ever that we have ever seen in Latin America. It is active in all countries. It has subsidiaries like Movimiento Sin Tierra in Brazil, Piqueteros in Argentina, FARC in Colombia. It has wholly owned franchises, Bolivia, Ecuador, Nicaragua. It has joint ventures with Argentina, uh, Caribbean countries, and non-aggression pacts with countries that because of their weight should have a better or a more stronger say in what happens like, like Brazil. I won't get into all the system, but trust me, it is very effective. It is nothing to sneeze out. It is called populism. Take it from me, it's too benign a term to capture what it means. It's populism to win the election and then becomes tyranny by changing the Constitution to have a long-term regime where you control absolutely all the levers of power. And if it was just in Venezuela, it, I wouldn't be here talking. It is just active in every country. And no one in the history of mankind has spent as much discretionary money for political distortion, meddling, and co-opting of countries and governments like this current regime uh, has been uh, spending. And they are very effective. It is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, to sneeze at. People uh, have said, no, no, the Chavez is cantinflas, and he's a clown, and he's this, and he's that. He's not. He's got all the money, and he's this incredibly powerful communication uh, mix of CNN with the Comedy Central, with History Channel, with MTV and the religious channel all mixed into one. Plus, he owns the remote control. You can't ever stop seeing him. Every time he wants to talk, he just keeps at it uh, for a good long time. And it's a very effective system. And the recipe is you seize power through the ballot box, and then you change the Constitution to dominate justice, control Congress, dismantle institutions, centralize revenue, set up intelligence systems, control the electoral uh, registrations, buy off the armed forces, uh, intimidate the church, close down the media, seize all the means of production. So everything that you can do about making regulations that will foster the Floreses for more green is goes out the window when you lose the basic freedoms uh, that a democracy and a rule of law uh, entail. And that is a system that, is, that, that gets installed. How can you best address that? If you ask me, where is the answer to this type of thing come? I quite frankly do not think it comes from this city or from Europe or from the OAS. If you took a secret ballot at the OAS, Mr. Chavez has 21 of, 31, of 34 votes, by the way. He's got more influence than anybody, so for, you can forget that. Uh, with the U.S., if you can do something worthwhile, go green and stop buying his oil. You know, he gets one plant Colombia from the U.S. every five days. And then he complains about everything else because he sells his oil uh, over here. I quite frankly think that the answer will come from the people of Venezuela, from the people of Latin America that want to live in freedom under rule of law and uh, not under a system where uh, everything is forbidden or everything is mandatory. That goes against all the freedoms that set up a system whereby entrepreneurship can flourish and, uh, and have us uh, move forward. I think the next year should be interesting. Uh, Mr. Chavez is coming all out for Salvador in, in March, and anything that anybody can do to help, you, we should all be able to do. We'll have elections at the end of the year in Bolivia in December, and the price of oil is going down. I have become somewhat uh, morbid about this. I look at the internet screen, I see the price of oil going down, and I start celebrating because I know for, to the dime what he can do with that money, how many soldiers he buys, how many 
people he can intimidate, all the things that he can do. And he's doing that through the financing of the oil. And I mention that because this is not a political forum, but I will tell you that if you can design the best systems with the best civil servants, with the best rule of law, with the best regulations that foster entrepreneurship, but he, Mr. Chavez, can move a lot faster with a, if he keeps having the oil money to destroy all the good work than anybody else uh, can do. I'll, I'll close by, um, in summary, telling you that this is a, um, there are lessons that we should have learned from what, what has happened. To think that the 90s was the heyday of democracy and markets, and our icons should be Mr. Fujimori or Mr. Menem. I at least do not take that as something that uh, we shouldn't have to apologize for that, nor think that that was the best way to, to move forward. I think we have a pending agenda on building institutions, on developing social programs, and allowing entrepreneurship to flow through systems uh, inside the countries, better regional integration, and to uh, make sure that we set up systems whereby the people in this book are not the exception, but rather the rule. And hopefully the Chavez's and the Ortegas are the exception uh, and not the rule around the, the hemisphere. If you ever want to come down to Bolivia and visit, I'll take you uh, to do something that's very nice, go climb the mountains. Uh, you know the Western Andes Range and the Eastern Andes Range split up in Bolivia. Illimani is on the Eastern side. I go climb it occasionally. Uh, and since we live in a hole in La Paz, because we're in the middle of the mountains, we have a peculiar situation. We don't ever see the sunrise. If you want to see the sunrise, you've got to go climb the Yimani or the Eastern Mountain Range. So if you ever want to come down and see a sunrise, we'll do that. And I've learned that if you want to go see the sunrise and go to the top of the mountain, you have to get a team, you have to get a rope line, you have to get the equipment. And that is what fostering entrepreneurship is all about, setting up the systems, the equipment, the rope line, the team, the food, the supplies, to be able to get to the sunrise of prosperity. But I think this book proves beyond a doubt that people in their own selves have the legs, the lungs, and the drive to get to the top of the mountain. You just have to furnish them with a the rope and the teamwork and the supplies to make sure the sunrise of prosperity is something available for all of us. Thank you.